It's at 12. Good morning, San Antonio starts right now. Hi, good morning. It is Thursday, April 8th, and things are warming up outside, but we'll talk to Justin in just a minute. Yeah, it's been really foggy. We'll get an update from him coming up in just moments. Starbucks is going green in a whole new way. That's right. This is just ahead of Earth Day, so Starbucks is launching a Borrow a Cup program, letting customers order their Java in a reusable cup for a dollar deposit after having to suspend its Bring Your Own Cup policy during the pandemic. The two-month program will run at five stores in Seattle through the end of this month, letting customers order a hot or cold beverage in a reusable cup. And once they finish, customers can scan back cups at one of the participating shops, contactless return kiosk, and a $1 credit and 10 bonus stars will be awarded via Starbucks Rewards account to anyone who returns the cups. Starbucks discontinued its policy, allowing customers to bring their own cups into coffee shops early into the pandemic last year to curb the spread of the virus. However, customers are still not allowed to bring their own cups into the stores. The chain instead partnered with GoBox to pick up used cups to clean and sanitize them in less than 48 hours through its own Borrow a Cup initiative. This runs completely counter to anything I was thinking that Starbucks would be doing here, mm -hmm. even though we're on the what we hope is the tail end of a worldwide pandemic. It's a... Uh it's a very big first step. Well, it, it is announcing that the, the reusable cup replaces 30 disposable ones. But Which is a gr great, great green concept. I just, I guess I would want to know more about the process of cleaning and sanitizing these cups. I was just thinking the same thing. <laughs> well, hopefully uh, they're doing all they can to keep everything very, very clean. Again, borrow a cup taking place up there in Seattle. All right, let's look at today's nine at nine. Governor Greg Abbott calling on the federal government to close the facility housing migrant children at the Freeman Coliseum after complaints of abuse and understaffing. The Texas Rangers are investigating the allegations. Today, President Joe Biden will unveil six executive actions aimed at curbing gun violence. The actions range from tightening restrictions on so-called ghost guns to nominating a gun control advocate to lead the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives. More witnesses are expected to take the stand today in the trial of former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin, charged in the death of George Floyd. Jurors have heard from 30 witnesses so far, all of them called by the prosecution. The CDC says the coronavirus variant first identified in the UK is now the most common strain of the virus here in the U.S. Case numbers in the U.S. have risen over the last four weeks, in part because of that and other variants. President Biden is considering a withdrawal of troops from Iraq as the threat from ISIS decreases. About 2,500 U.S. troops are currently in the country as part of a global operation to defeat ISIS in parts of Iraq and Syria. The Biden administration says it's resumed U.S. assistance to the Palestinians. The State Department will provide $235 million to projects in the West Bank and Gaza Strip, as well as the U.N. Relief and Works Agency. U.S. Customs and Border Protection is seeking an exponential increase in counterfeit masks. More than 34 million counterfeit masks have been seized since the start of the pandemic. Disney World will allow guests to take off their masks for photos starting today. Previously, guests were only allowed to take them off when actively eating or drinking. And the first round of the Masters begins in Augusta, Georgia this morning. Tiger Woods will be noticeably absent from the tournament as he continues to recover from multiple leg injuries following a February crash in Los Angeles. And that's today's 9 at 9. It's been a very foggy morning, so hopefully everybody's safe out there. Let's take a peek out there. I haven't been outside yet in a little while, Justin. You were on your way in a while ago, and it looks like it's kind of hanging in there fog-wise. A little bit. It's going to start getting better here very soon. In fact, the sun just popped out here at the station. And before we jump into the forecast really quick, a uh, quick note, something that's very exciting. We're three years away, officially now, from the total solar eclipse. April 8, 2024, we will see a total solar eclipse. And uh, there we go. Try to pull it up for you here. The moon will get in the way of the sun. The path of totality will move through San Antonio and the hill country. This is a big deal. We see solar eclipses, but not necessarily right where you live. And that's what most of us will get to see. The path of totality goes right over Del Rio, San Antonio, Austin, up to Dallas. Again, we're officially three years away. Just a quick update. Something exciting in the weather world, at least I think so. We'll keep you posted as we get closer. We got some time, right? 
Uh, let's look at the visibility now down to about five miles here in San Antonio. That's actually an improvement. New Braunfels, two miles, about a mile Bernie stage, mile and three quarters at Castroville. Hondo still down about a quarter of a mile. So there is still some fog out there. This should lift within the hour. The other very bad news. Oak is in the very high category, 20,300. We've set a new high now this season. We'll see if it continues its trek upwards tomorrow, but uh, it is uh, extremely thick right now. 90 degrees, 3 o'clock, 95 by 5 o'clock. Mostly sunny skies this afternoon. Southerly winds 10 to 15 miles per hour. It's going to be a hot day, even hotter tomorrow. And there could be some issues here around San Antonio. Guys. Thank you, Justin. Speaking of those hot days to provide relief from the high temperatures expected today and tomorrow, the city of San Antonio will open multiple cooling centers. All centers will observe COVID-19 precautions such as mandatory face coverings, screenings, sanitation and social distancing. We have a list of all the cooling centers right now on KSAT.com. We've had a tricky morning commute and it is over uh, as of nine o'clock, but right now the roads look fantastic. There's 410 at Rolling Ridge. We'll keep an eye on these trans guide cameras. There's 410 at Jackson Keller. And top stories we are following today. Firefighters are still looking for one man after a fire destroyed a home in southwest Bear County early this morning. We've been tracking this story all morning long. A woman and her teenage daughter escaped the flames and are recovering at University Hospital. Fire crews from Lytle and Bear County found the home in the 15,400 block of Old Frio City Road covered in flames. A neighboring shed and a vehicle were damaged and the home is considered a total loss. Crews tell us the man they're looking for is 84 years old and right now investigators are still looking into what sparked that fire. As we mentioned in the night at nine, Governor Greg Abbott is calling for an investigation into alleged sexual abuse claims and lack of staff over at Freeman Coliseum. The governor asked the Texas Rangers and the Texas Department of Public Safety to investigate, and he expects he may have an answer as early as today. Abbott called the complaints, quote, credible and said they came from at least one person who had been inside the facility. The allegations include sexual assault, understaffing, people not being fed enough, and COVID-positive children not being isolated from others. San Antonio Mayor Ron Nirenberg released a statement on this saying, quote, these allegations about the federal operation are disturbing, if true, and a thorough investigation is warranted. A White House regional spokesperson told us, quote, currently we see no basis for Governor Abbott's call to shut down the San Antonio Freeman Coliseum as an intake site. However, his claims will be looked into and investigated by the Department of Health and Human Services. And we'll talk more about this coming up in our Tribune Thursday report as well. Are you looking for a job? Choice Career Fairs is hosting a job fair today. It's happening from 11 to 2 at the Norris Conference Center. Some employers attending include Barden Circulation, Blue Science Pools, Farmers Insurance, and Roy Moss Youth Alternatives. Jobs available include bookkeeping, customer service, education, financial services, and sales. We have more information on the career fair right now on KSAT.com. A reminder that KSAT, the San Antonio Report, and Bear Facts are teaming up to hold a debate on Proposition B tonight. Our Steve Spreester will moderate as we hear from both sides of the issue regarding the San Antonio Police Department's collective bargaining rights. SAPOA, the Police Officers Union, FIX SAPD, and the City Attorney will all be here. They'll be live, we will be live streaming the debate on KSAT.com and on the KSAT TV app. Again, that all starts tonight at 7 o'clock. Please tune in. In your morning headlines, bad news when it comes to unemployment benefit numbers and the search is on for an employee after a plant explosion. It's not every day you see a bear wandering down your street or a giant lizard doing a little grocery shopping and David Sears has both. Good morning. Giant lizards are kind of picky when it comes to shopping, I found out. We've heard yeah. that. Yeah. We'll show you that to you in just a second, but first, we're going to start with the unemployment numbers turning back in the wrong direction. Last week, there were 744,000 applications for unemployment benefits. That's up 16,000 from the week before. Even though the number of vaccines being administered are on the rise, and employers are still cutting jobs. Disaster in Columbus, Ohio. There was a paint plant explosion just after midnight. At least eight employees were injured. One is missing as of late this morning. Two of the injured were actually trapped inside. They had to be rescued by firefighters. They were transported to a hospital, but they're expected to be OK. Because of the chemicals on site, hazmat teams had to be called in, but they were just standing by. Some of the early difficulty with that was because of the explosion, the rooms structurally were damaged and we had to go through fallen ceiling and, you know, 
furniture that had been blown across the room. But uh, we had a couple companies get in there and they did a thorough search and were not able to find anybody. Yeah, that search is still on for the missing employee. Fire officials are letting the fire burn itself out because they have determined that the materials are safe. The investigation into the cause is just getting underway. All right, let's take it to Houston. This is the Channel View area, and this is a massive fire at an industrial plant. It was a two alarm fire that started yesterday afternoon around four. The 95 employees there were all found safe and accounted for. One employee had to be taken to the hospital as a precaution for a respiratory issue. As you can see, some serious flames and thick black smoke, a shelter in place order issued for the area, but it has since been lifted. The facility is a chemical plant and firefighters stayed on site overnight to monitor the situation to make sure the fire did not reignite. Harris County Pollution Control was also monitoring the air quality. The fire started when a product was being transferred from a large container to a smaller one, according to one of the directors at the plant. All right, I'm going to let you fill in your own bear puns for this story. Yep, that is a black bear wandering down the street in Pittsburgh. Yep, Pittsburgh. This happening around Mount Washington. There were several reports of the black bear roaming around the neighborhood to a local TV station. So this is why you always watch your local news here at BKSAT 12 because Dennis Bim heard about the bear because he was watching his local news up there in Pittsburgh. He saw the police out looking for the bear. Then lo and behold, he heard a noise outside and grabbed his camera phone and there it was. It was very wild. Yeah, definitely an experience. I've been hunting for 30 years and I've never seen a bear over the woods, but this morning I've seen one up close and personal. The Pennsylvania Game Commission was contacted and of course we are reminded to stay away from the bear. And finally, let's take it to Thailand where you never know who or what you're going to find in the convenience store. That is one of those monitor lizards and look, picky guys like I don't like that. I don't like where's the one I'm looking for. Climbs all the way up the shelves looking for something in particular, apparently. So maybe he's looking for a certain kind of lotion because, you know, those monitors, they're kind of dry skin. Oh, yeah, so absolutely. David, are you ready for this? Uh -huh. So where was that bear at? Like in Pittsburgh? Pittsburgh. OK, yeah. guess who starts a three game series with the Pittsburgh Pirates today? Uh, Chicago Cubs. <laughs> yeah, they start it's today. Yeah, so Pirates, be aware. The Bears and Cubs have been in town mm -hmm. for a few days in advance. There you go. So right. I like that. But watch your local news. Yeah. And we'll keep you informed. We when will. A bear is roaming down your street. It's okay to expect more people. Thank you, David. <laughs> right now it is 910, 70 degrees, still ahead on GMSA at 9. And we all know that fashion can be very expensive, but some experts think this airplane shaped bag from Louis Vuitton may be a little too too pricey. Why some say the bag will crash and burn. As we mentioned earlier, the Texas Rangers now investigating allegations that migrant children are being abused at Freeman Coliseum right here in San Antonio. We're going to talk with Alana Rocha at the Texas Tribune about what they have discovered about the allegations. That's coming up later in this newscast. The Strawberry Poteet Festival is a go this year. It actually kicks off tomorrow. But what has the last year been like for strawberry growers? And will there be enough strawberries? Well, just ahead on GMSA at 9, we speak to a local grower here in Poteet about what it's been like for them. And we look forward to that, Alicia. Now let's take a look at the Dow, down 70 points. We'll be right back. And welcome back. It's about 9.15. The Poteet Strawberry Festival is set to kick things off tomorrow after canceling last year's celebration due to the pandemic. Strawberry growers say it was hard as a hard hit to endure, but they're hopeful this year's sales will help make up for their loss. Alicia Beretta is live from KH Farms, one of the biggest strawberry farms in Poteet, with more on how growers have adapted and prepared for their biggest sale of the year. Good morning, Alicia. Good morning. Well, last year, strawberry growers were left with a surplus of strawberries, but really with no one or even nowhere to sell them. So they had to get creative with their sales. And this year, it's definitely looking brighter for KH Farms. They tell me they have so many berries that sometimes, some days, they just can't keep up. Welcome to KH Farm. What I have here is approximately four acres. Where the rows of bright red, juicy, and sweet strawberries seem to be endless. There's about 64,000 plants total in that four acres. The work to fill these pints started shortly after the 2020 Poteet Strawberry Festival fell through. It's the growers' biggest event of the year. 
It's one of those that you have to be completely dedicated to. It starts out in September and October, and uh, from that point, you know, you're just, you're keeping the plants alive and fertilized and stuff like that. During the past year, Ruth Ann had to get creative to help the business and land she inherited from her father survive the pandemic. It was a very big blow. For all of our farmers, it's like, we just didn't know what to do with it. Because I have enough berries, I could go to um, wholesale places that they wanted large quantities. I could go to those places and, and sell them. But the smaller farmers may not have been able to do that. Now at times, she can't even keep up with the supply. We're getting 60 and 65 flats a, a day in half a field, you know, which is not normal. Just in time for this weekend's festival. We make at least half of our profit at the Shari Festival. A sweet sign for growers in Poteet. We'll probably see as many or more berries than we have in the past. Well, so many strawberry varieties will be featured at this year's Poteet Strawberry Festival. And KH Farms, they actually place top five in two categories. That's Camino Real. So that's the berry that you see here. It's a smaller berry, a little bit more round, uh, but probably one of the sweetest. And then they have another variety that's Merced. That's in another farm. So if you're interested in supporting KH Farms and purchasing some of their berries, you can find them this weekend starting tomorrow, right next to the red pavilion and they tell me that they'll be under a yellow and white striped tent so i'm excited to try some of these i love who doesn't love sweet strawberries right, right mark and stuff oh wow it's so good to see them back this mm -hmm. year and a good looking crop of Absolutely. berries this year Yes, it looks good. Yeah, so many, so, so many strawberries out here. So there's plenty to go around, that's for sure. Well, the word's out. Now they're about to be picked clean. Thank <laughs> yes. you, Alicia, live down in Poteet. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. And then, again, that festival starts tomorrow, and they'll have it Saturday and Sunday as well. Justin is back keeping an eye on the fog, which has really become a problem in the early morning hours, and it's kind of backing off now, right? Yeah, it came in quick, and we saw visibility drop pretty quickly, but now we're starting to see it go away. The sun will pop out. It's already popped out here in San Antonio, and so we know that temperatures are going to be pretty toasty this afternoon. Good news, you just saw the Poteet Strawberry Festival. There's some of those strawberries. It's going to be good weather for that this weekend or for anything you have going on. Visibility-wise, we're down to about three miles in New Braunfels, one mile Bernie Stage, one and three quarters Castroville, but most of Bear County has cleared up. And uh, we'll continue to see that trend, I think, here over the next hour. Even Hondo, that number is starting to rise. And as we zoom out some, Sort of that corridor right there. Kerrville, Hondo down to Catula, where the fog has been thickest this morning. Uh, we did have a dense fog advisory until 10 o'clock. Looks like it's been canceled. So we're good there. No more issues. Dew point history. I want to show you this. And this is the reason we had the fog this morning. Dew points were really low yesterday afternoon, and that contributed to some really warm temperatures. We got up to 94. But within a couple of hours this morning, between about 4 and 6 a.m., the two point jumped up about 20 degrees. When you get that surge of moisture, a lot of times it can help create some fog as long as winds are calm, and that's what we saw. It is humid out there right now. Dew points are in the 60s. That changes. I told you, you remember yesterday, we're going to go back and forth with these dew points and the humidity. That is going to be the case again today. 69 right now, mostly cloudy. Humidity is at 90%, but that number will come down this afternoon. Southerly winds at 7 miles per hour. 66 Bulverde, 64 Bernie Stage, 67 in Hondo, 65 Tarpley, 65 up there in Kerrville, already in the 70s from Kennedy over to Victoria. And dew points are really high there. It is extremely sticky south and east of San Antonio, a little drier as you get up into the hill country. But that drier air comes in from the west again today, and we'll see those dew points drop off. Once that happens, temperatures jump up. 95 degrees, the expected high here in San Antonio. I do think we'll get some triple digits down to the south and west. 101 in Catula, 99 Carrizo Springs, 100 potentially out in Del Rio. We'll fast forward to tomorrow. Same story, but even warmer. 97 here in town, triple digits Carrizo Springs over to Eagle Pass and Del Rio. So it's going to be a warm next couple of days. There's a look at the visible satellite picture. We're seeing a break in the clouds moving into southern Bear County. So the sun will be out here soon. And uh, looking at the bigger picture, big storm system swirling up there across parts of Missouri. Storms all around a uh, cold front that extends down towards New Orleans. A lot of severe weather, or at least some severe weather today along that front as it moves east. Our forecast, dry line again in place today doesn't do a whole lot, maybe creates a couple of storms to our north. As we get into tomorrow, we had been talking about the potential for a couple of storms tomorrow afternoon. It's not looking good. There's a huge cap over the atmosphere, and I just don't think we're going to get much going. Still, can't roll out an isolated storm east of San Antonio tomorrow afternoon. 
Then we get a, a frontal boundary through here Saturday morning. That brings in drier air, does cool us down a little bit for the weekend, thankfully. And so the weekend looks really pretty good. There is potential for some severe weather tomorrow, though. We mentioned a couple storms, I think, well east of here. The biggest threat for severe weather is going to be up towards Dallas, Tyler, and Shreveport. Forecast, 97 tomorrow, as we pointed out. 84, though, on Saturday and breezy. 89 Sunday. Weekend looks good. 20% chance rain Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. There's some chances there. It doesn't look like we're going to get a lot of measurable rain, but it's something to watch. And it does cool down some Tuesday into Wednesday, once again, into the 70s. That sounds a lot better, guys. Yes, it does. I agree. Thank you, Justin. Minus 920 what? still ahead on GMSA at 9. Louis Vuitton has released a new travel bag shaped like an airplane. The price tag, $39,000. How people on social media are reacting to this bag. Steph, would you buy a travel bag for $39,000 even if you had the money? No. 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 What if it was shaped like an airplane and had the Louis Vuitton logo all over it? No. 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 Not today. Not, not ever. So social media users largely think the new accessory should crash and burn. Oh, <laughs> but wow. CNN's Jeannie Mose reports some fashionistas predict sales will take off. Fasten your seatbelts. This bag has hit some turbulence. I think the average consumer is gonna go, what? This Louis Vuitton airplane bag sells for 39,000 bucks. You can buy an actual plane for less, noted someone posting a used Cessna selling for just over 32,000 to prove it. The luxury design house showed a travel themed collection at its latest men's show, and there it was, more of a collector's item. Or as celebrity stylist Philip Block put it. And I think it was the fantasy we all want. We all want to escape our living rooms right now. Yeah, well for $39,000, can it fly? Can you even find things you put in there? Where's my chapstick? Have you checked the cockpit? On the bright side, look at all the miles to be earned on purchasing this. Covered with a famous Louis Vuitton logo, it looks like a military transport plane, but who would be transporting it? But you will definitely see that bag in rappers' videos. It's very Cardi B, maybe. Lady Gaga would live for that bag. It's the work of Louis Vuitton men's artistic director, Virgil Abloh, who once tweeted, then later deleted, design is the freshest scam, quote me on that one. And though non-fashionistas ragged on the bag, someone offered to just glue some handles on this, some who follow fashion were smitten. Pretty cool, looks so good. But that wingspan, you would have a lot of plane crashes with that bag. You'd be crashing into everything. This is a bag that practically invites you to pick it up. Come fly with me, let's fly, let's fly away. Just don't expect it to fit in the overhead luggage bin. I think that's something that would have to sit on your lap like a service dog. Goes perfectly with that $1,100 Louis Vuitton mink sleep mask. Come fly with me. Genie Mouse, CNN, New York. And the guys that fly those C5s out at Lackland are like, no, it doesn't. It doesn't <laughs> look like that. Mike Ostrich told us this morning that he thought the bags were kind of cool. I can imagine no. this, Mike in the aisle holding up a bunch of people trying to squeeze that bag into the overhead bin, the wings sticking out, the engine sticking out. <laughs> yeah, well, you can't hold it like this. You'd have to, you know, yeah, you'd have to fly it in the aisle. <laughs> but for 39 k I mean, that's first class airfare to like Fiji or something. Yeah. Wouldn't that be more fun? I, I agree. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Almost it's, everybody agrees. I don't think it's worth it. Yeah. 928 on your Thursday morning. There's more ahead on TMSA at 9. A trial stemming from the 2017 Sutherland Springs massacre that left 26 people dead now underway in a federal district court in San Antonio. Erica Hernandez will join us to debrief the case. Another rough loss for our Spurs this time against the Nuggets in Denver. David is back to break down what went wrong this time. Governor Greg Abbott banning state agencies and state funded organizations from requiring proof of a COVID-19 vaccination. Alana Rocha with the Texas Tribune will join us to talk more about these vaccine passports after the break.
The Texas Rangers are now investigating allegations that unaccompanied migrant children are being abused at Freeman Coliseum here in San Antonio. Governor Greg Abbott banning state agencies and state-funded organizations from requiring proof of a COVID-19 vaccination. Alana Rocha with the Texas Tribune joins us now to talk more about these vaccine passports and more. Good morning, Alana. Good morning. Alana, let's begin with the investigation into these allegations over at Freeman Coliseum. What has the Trib learned so far? Yeah, I mean, like you watching uh, the press conference uh, yesterday with the governor, there's a lot we don't know, and there's a lot to be investigated. I mean, the fact that the governor admitted he has yet to be inside this facility and see what the conditions are, but that he has a, a trusted source or several people uh, who, you know, allege similar things uh, in order to call for such an investigation. Uh, you know, there's still a lot to find out, and, and we did confirm through a spokesperson that uh, his office, that being the governor's office, did give uh, the Biden administration a uh, heads up and, and, you know, notified them about the allegations prior to the press conference yesterday. But we'll just have to be watching to see how this plays out. A lot of different perspectives. One of your local officials saying there she has been inside, that the kids seem well cared for. There's plenty of space to add more, uh, despite what the governor said. Um, so uh, a lot of allegations right now, a lot to be investigated. And Alana, this week, Governor Greg Abbott announced he is banning state agencies, political subdivisions, and organizations receiving public funds from creating vaccine passports or otherwise requiring someone to provide proof of a COVID-19 vaccine in order to receive services. Now, the governor's argument is very much in line with Republicans across the country, but what is the argument against them? Yeah, I mean, the fact that basically it just comes down to walking a fine line of, you know, instilling confidence uh, for people to return to, to venues, return to the workplace uh, with, you know, infringing on somebody's uh, privacy rights when it comes to health care uh, and, and just personal freedom uh, not to share such information. And so, yes, he is in line with other, uh, you know, Republican officials across the country. He hasn't gone quite as far as, say, the Florida governor who uh, banned all businesses, not just those uh, state agencies or state funded organizations uh, from requiring uh, such passports or proof. Although the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, its guidelines do say that businesses can require that their employees be vaccinated in order to return to the workplace. And again, instill that confidence that the area is COVID free. Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton's filed another lawsuit against uh, the Biden administration, this time to force the feds to deport more people convicted of crimes. This is the latest in a series of legal challenges Paxton has brought against the new administration since January. What's the issue here specifically and how does it relate to Texas. Yeah, I mean, we're talking about detainer requests. Those are when Immigration and Customs Enforcement people or officials uh, issue detainer requests to local law enforcement when they see an undocumented immigrant is in their custody, uh, flagging that law enforcement saying, hey, we want to take custody of that person when their sentence is complete. Uh, there's kind of murky things on whether the, the local enforcement uh, entities need to adhere to those. But a lot of this is just a change from the Trump administration that prioritized all undocumented immigrants in the country illegally. Biden has said that while they review immigration policies and, and resources are stretched thin, they're prioritizing those who pose threats to national security, border security, public safety. And so Paxton, along with the attorney general in Louisiana, is saying, hey, uh, you know, he's allowing criminals to roam free uh, in our state and, uh, you know, is calling on the courts to, to block the policy from taking effect and reimburse the states for the uh, court costs to bring such an action. All right, Alana Rocha with the Texas Tribune. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Coming out of Tribune, we have some breaking news as we go to live cam. U.S. authorities now say they have picked up nearly 19,000 children traveling alone across the Mexican border in March. That's the largest monthly number ever recorded and a major test for the Biden administration. Justin? Thank you. You saw the look outside there. We still have a little bit of fog trying to hold on, but most of that is going away. I want to show you a picture on our KSAC Connect. This is uh, kind of cool. You have to look closely here, but this is uh, probably a SpaceX Starlink. It's right there in the middle of the picture. You may have to get right up on the TV to see it. But uh, that was the uh, Starlink satellite train. Uh, a few people reported seeing it last night. It's sort of like a line across the sky. Uh, it, it joins it, its satellites. They're going to join thousands of others to bring high speed Internet that they're uh, putting up in the space. SpaceX is doing that. But uh, thank you for catching that.
and uh, we got a few more pictures of that coming in. Meantime, visibility. I mentioned it's improving here in Bear County. Hondo, it's improving. Castroville, we're seeing some improvement there too. So I think this fog's going to be going away here very soon if you're out in Medina County. Temperatures 71 at the airport, 65 Kerrville, 68 in Hondo, 67 right now at Del Rio. We get it all the way up to 95 today. Mostly sunny. Southerly winds 10 to 15. Even warmer tomorrow in Colorado State. Just put out their hurricane forecast. We'll discuss a little bit about that coming up here in just a few minutes. Guys. Thank you, Justin. A trial is now underway in federal district court right here in San Antonio, stemming from the 2017 Sutherland Springs massacre that left 26 people dead. The case is a lawsuit filed by the victim's family of the First Baptist Church against the United States government. Our Eric Hernandez was following the case yesterday and joins us now to talk more about it. Hey, good morning. Hey, guys. Good morning. Hey, Erica, first, give us some background into this lawsuit. So this lawsuit was initially filed uh, in 2018 after the shooting, and the families are pretty much suing the, the United States government for negligence, for not putting the shooter's name in the national background checks for guns, for, to purchase guns. He uh, had convicted some crimes while in the military, and after that, he was supposed to, his name was supposed to be in that database. So to make sure he never was allowed to purchase guns, but it was not put in. So that is the lawsuit that they filed against the government at this time in this bench trial. Now specifically, they're, they're blaming the United States Air Force. For those who may not know, let's talk a little bit about the difference between a bench trial and a jury trial. So the bench trial is what's taking place right now, and the difference is that there is no jury. So the judge is ultimately going to decide this liability phase. He's going to hear it. It's going to take about two to three weeks, and then he'll decide if this will go on to the damages phase in a federal courtroom. And Erica, what was some of the testimony given yesterday? It was very traumatic testimony that was heard. The first witness that took the stand was the shooter's wife, Danielle Smith, and she, you know, talked about the abuse that she withstood throughout her marriage from him. She talked about his fascination with guns as well as what happened that morning of the shooting. A lot of the details she's releasing is details that we are hearing for the first time. Um, so it was very traumatic and she was pretty much on the stand all day. Um, currently on the stand right now is the Texas Ranger who was the lead investigator. How long will this trial last and when do we think a judge might rule on it? So the trial is expected to last anywhere from two to three weeks because there is a lot of testimony to be given. Like I said, this is the first time we're hearing a lot of these details from that day. And it could take the judge even after that another couple of weeks to, to see what he decides. This is a liability phase. So if he does find the, uh, the government liable, it would go to the damages phase. And for people wanting to follow it, we can find more information on KSET.com. Yeah, we'll continue to follow this case as it's going. It's 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 in a national in a federal courtroom, so we our cameras are not allowed in. So right. we're keeping you updated on KSET.com right now. In a way, Erica, this is kind of full circle for you. You were, uh, the, I think, the first on the scene for KSET down mm -hmm. there at the church in Sutherland Springs. Were you not? Yes, I was. So yeah, it is full circle. And hearing some of these details yesterday, it brought back a lot of the memories of the day, um, and and hearing um, the wife speak just how that morning kind of took place from her perspective and from his mindset. Mm -hmm. um, it was very chilling testimony. And um, it's, it's going to be difficult throughout the days to hear some of the testimony. I'm not sure all the, uh, the people who will take the stand. But like I said, it's something we will continue to follow on, on KSAD.com. All right. Tough job ahead. Thank yeah. you very much, Thank Erica. You. We appreciate Thanks, it. Erica. Right now, it is 940 on your Thursday morning. We're hovering right around 70 degrees. And you are watching GMSA at 9. And our Spurs fall to ninth place after last night's loss against Nuggets. David is back to give us his thoughts after the break. The Spurs started a five-game road trip last night in Denver. And they picked right up where they left off here at home. David Sears has returned to fill us in on what happened, more importantly, did not happen in the Mile High City. David? They didn't play well enough for four quarters. That's what yeah. didn't happen. Again. Hey, they actually got off to a pretty good start last night in Denver, and folks sitting at home watching this game are going, all right, all right, we're going to turn this thing around. Here we go. And then stuff like that happens right there. And Nikolai Jokic. You know, they actually held the guy to 25 points, which is a point below his season average. So that's okay. something, right? Well, yes, that's it is positive. something. Spurs got off to a good start last night. They were up, and then they got tied, and then they were up again. And then Jante Murray and Keldon Johnson had a pretty good first half. Third quarter, the Spurs got up by nine, but then the bench came in, and they were cold. 
Patty Mills had 12, but other than that, nobody was even close to double digits. I think like uh, Quandary had like seven, and that was that was it. They were just flat out cold. So they were up nine, and by the end of the third, they were like down seven, and then they ended up losing 106 to 96. So usually rely on the bench. Usually the bench for the Spurs is pretty good, mm -hmm. but the last few games. Mm, not so much. And after the game, that's what Pop was talking about, is how their bench kind of let them down lately. Poor play by too many people. Uh, second team has got to play better. You know, if you just look at the plus minus for the last few games, uh, first team's doing pretty well, but uh, off the bench, we've been uh, just destroyed. And it happened again tonight. I like that word destroyed. Yeah. Okay. So the Spurs usually let a team shoot better than 50% at home. Remember that stat we mm -hmm. were talking about when they were playing that nine game homestand, all those teams are shooting better than 50%. Yep. Nuggets didn't shoot close to 50%. They only shot um, 44%. But the problem was the Spurs only shot 42%. Oh. So, so that didn't help. So, hey, oh my gosh. So, so at least they held a team below 50%. Okay. So that's okay. something. We're, we're looking for the positive, Steph. Yes. I'm trying to Thank fill you, up David. your glass. <laughs> I'm trying to get at least half full on this deal. Thank okay, you. but now, now I'm about to empty your glass. Uh -oh. One Not time they, they were six games up above 500. Now they're one game below 500. Uh, yeah. And they're like, uh, I don't know, two and nine in their last 11. Um, sorry, sorry, Steph. Uh, they try again tomorrow. Easy come, easy go. On a, on <laughs> right? A glass tomorrow? Half full, glass half empty. So tomorrow night they got the Nuggets again. You know, and it's hard to beat a team twice in a row. So that's what the Spurs okay. have going for them since All they right. lost last night to the Nuggets. Then, you know, they, they got a good chance tomorrow night against the Nuggets. I, I don't and know if you noticed twice and, the last couple yeah. times we've talked about the Spurs, I've been speechless. I just think that's best for everybody. Just not say anything? <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, you're, you're welcome to express I, your I opinion. know. I'm just, you know, you know I'm like all, a lot of Spurs fans. I'm just really frustrated right now because we've got a, a good young group of guys yeah. who got great coaches, and it's just not happening this year. Well, you know, they're, they're headed to a good draft. <laughs> good draft. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Wait, it's that's, true. That's the direction you're going. I'm sorry. When you're draft position, when okay. you're two so and we're, nine in your last eleven, wow. where are you going? Not too far after the All Star break, and we're already there. Okay, no, David the Sears. Wrong direction. There's a game tomorrow. Right. <laughs> Thank right. you, David. They got time to turn it around. That's the positive. They got time right. to turn it yeah. around. They're still in the playoff hunt. Thank you, David. All right. Uh, so again, Nuggets coming up, and then you said the Mavs, right? Okay. Okay. Thank you, David. 947. Hi, Justin, Justin <laughs> you want to be a part of this conversation or do you want to run the other way? Uh, we're we're going to run the other way. Okay. okay. Yeah. I, I do like that he was a little more positive. Yeah. I was feeling that. <laughs> yeah. It felt weird well, to yeah. me. It felt weird. It, it felt a little strange. <laughs> no, a little strange. It was great. <laughs> So, Glad to have Positive David on yeah, board. Positive David is always refreshing. Yeah. Uh, we just got this in, guys. Hurricane forecast. Colorado State puts out their forecast every year. And look, it's a generalization. Uh, it's never going to be exact. But w the takeaway from this is that we believe that it will be another above average season in the Atlantic. Yes, we got through a ton of storms last year, if you remember. And by the way, this year, we're not going into the Greek alphabet if we do indeed get there again. Let's hope we don't. But they're changing that. We're just going to start over with A, B, C and go in that direction. These are the forecast numbers here. So they're thinking 17 named storms, eight hurricanes, four major hurricanes. The bottom line there is the average. So this would be an above average season. We always look out to the Pacific to get an idea for this. And we're in a La Nina right now. Looks like we may move into a more neutral phase. What does that mean? Well, La Nina typically enhances hurricanes or en enhances the activity in the Atlantic. If we were in El, Ni El Nino out in the Pacific, it would likely be a quieter hurricane season in the, in the Atlantic. Again, main takeaway here is that it is going to be uh, likely a busier season. Visibility is down to about two miles in Hondo, four miles in Castroville, but these numbers are up. We've been watching this throughout the show. We've been seeing improvement. So the fog is uh, basically going away here. Katua is still looking at a mile and a quarter. And here's a look at the time lapse. You can see the, the, the fog roll in, but it didn't last all that long. And now we're starting to see sun. Sun is popping out and temperatures are really starting to warm up. 71 degrees at the airport. Southerly winds at about nine. Dew point is at 65. And you can see the breaks in the clouds are already there. So if we see sun this early, likely temperatures are going to be pretty toasty this afternoon. 77 Kennedy, 69 Gonzalez, 62 right now in Austin. And the clouds get a little thicker, fog and clouds out west. 
but those are quickly dissipating. 64, the dew point in Kerrville, 65 here in town. So that still puts us in the muggy category. By the afternoon, some drier air will mix in and we'll get these dew points uh, to go lower, just like they did yesterday. That will boost the temperatures. 95, the expected high here in San Antonio. I think we'll see some triple digits down to the south and west. And then as we get into tomorrow, even hotter, 97 here in town, triple digits, a good bet as you get down towards Eagle Pass, Del Rio, Carrizo Springs. Forecast calls for the dry line to sort of set up today. It doesn't do a whole lot for us. May kick off a storm off to the north. Same story again tomorrow, although with the dry line in place, I think there could be some more storms across northeast Texas. At this point, it looks like we're going to miss out. The, the cap is just too strong. Can't rule out a stray storm tomorrow afternoon east of I-35, but it doesn't look great. Front comes through Saturday morning. This does cool us down, brings in dry air yet again. And so the weekend actually looks pretty good. And then we'll get some rain chances back in the picture next week. This is a severe weather risk tomorrow on Friday. And it shows Dallas, Tyler, Shreveport with the highest risk for some severe weather. But slight risk comes all the way down to Austin. We'll keep an eye on the radar tomorrow, but we're only going to put in a 20% chance, if that, east of I-35. Cooler on Saturday, 84, 89 on Sunday. And yes, some slight rain chances come back into play Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, along with some cooler temperatures. We'll be right back. New study found a possible link between COVID infections and subsequent diagnosis of mental health and neurological disorders. Coming up on the News at Noon, why COVID survivors appear to be at increased risk of anxiety and mood disorders. Tomorrow on GMSA at 9, CPS Energy owes around $700 million for natural gas from February's winter storm. Energy experts tell the case at Defenders the staggering figures show CPS wasn't ready for the storm. Dylan Collier will join us to debrief this investigation tomorrow at 9. We know a lot of folks will want to see that outside with uh, Transguide right now, and we are looking at some sunshine, Justin Horn. The sun is out. Temperatures are on their way up 73 right now, and we're expecting 95 this afternoon. We haven't been this warm since October. Gets even warmer tomorrow, 97 for a high. A slight chance for shower east of I-35. Weekend looks pretty good. Drier air, 84 on Saturday, 89 Sunday. Thank you, sir. How long have we been hearing rumors about a possible reunion? of the cast of Friends. Forever, and Forever. now we have good news for Friends fans like our producer Oriana. Friends cast will finally begin filming a reunion this week. Yeah, Friends fanatics, we have the most exciting news you're gonna hear. Mm -hmm. they are, we, it is beginning filming this week. According to the deadline, it will include all the stars, Jennifer Aniston, Courtney Cox, Lisa Kudrow, Matthew Perry, David Schwimmer, and Matt LeBlanc, and they'll be doing it back on the original soundstage at Warner Brothers Studios set in Burbank, California. It's going to be called the one where they got back together and it was supposed to begin filming at the beginning of 2020, but the pandemic put it on hold. All right, more on that on KSAT.com. Have a great day, guys. Thanks for watching our friends.